here the L term coming from the SL2 orbit, so there's a constant term here, but don't worry about that. That doesn't really matter. In the full spectral flow, that gets cancelled with the corresponding term from SU2. So before spectral flow, this is what our Roman sector representation looks like, right? We have some, we have some ground states. You move upwards and downwards with j plus zero and j minus zero, right, as you do. And then you have all the negative modes, and the negative modes move you upwards, and you fill out all the dots that you can draw here. Now, think about it, what this representation looks like with respect to... So this is the representation we're going to look at with respect to the tilde modes. And now we want to ask, what does this representation look like when we interpret it with respect to the untilde modes? Now, with respect to the untilde modes, let's draw the coordinate lines of J30 and L0. Now, J30 differs from J3 tilde 0 only by a constant. So basically, J30 coordinate axis is parallel to the J3 tilde coordinate axis, but the L0 coordinate axis is proportional to L tilde 0 and minus J3 tilde 0. So it goes at a 45 degree angle uh, like that. So you have to look at the same dots. But now when you try to determine their eigenvalues, you always have to take the projection onto the corresponding axis. That's how you're going to determine what their L0 eigenvalue and their J30 eigenvalue is going to be. Now, if you stare at this picture, you see I've drawn the line here, which corresponds to L0 is equal to 0. And what you should uh, take note of is that there's a lot of stuff down here, right? So the L0 spectrum has, uh, I mean, all of it that is to the left-hand side has L0 positive, but there's this whole stuff here, and obviously these dots don't stop here, they continue going, that are over there, so the L0 spectrum of this representation is unbounded. It has, it's unbounded from below, it goes as negative as you want. And that's in some sense what you need, because you see, if you think about doing string theory in flat space, in, in, in flat Minkowski space, you also have an unbounded L0 spectrum, because you can choose a light-like momentum to be as time-like as you want, and the corresponding V, the L0 eigenvalue, is also as negative as it, as it, as it goes. And that's necessary in order to get an interesting uh, spectrum, because, you see, remember, at the end of the day, in bosonic string theory, you have to set L0 is equal to 1, and you wouldn't be able to have infinitely many oscillators if you didn't have a reservoir of infinitely negative L0. So the fact that the L0 spectrum is negative is not something that should shock you. That's something that's similar in flat space, and that's what you get once you, in once you consider these spectrally flow representations. So, so you may be worried about dealing with representations with a, a negative L0 spectrum, but actually this theory is still pretty well behaved, and the reason is that, you see, if you concentrate yourself at states with a fixed eigenvalue of J30, if you look at the, at the uh, vertical lines, then the vertical lines, the L0 spectrum, is bounded. So it's uniformly unbounded, but if you fix J30, it's always bounded. And therefore, when you calculate correlation functions, you will never pick up essential singularities. You will only get poles because you'll always fix the eigenvalue of J30. And as a consequence, while the L0 spectrum isn't bounded by zero anymore, for a given value of J30, it's always bounded by something. And that something is some number. And therefore, everything is not as crazy as it looks. Anyway, yeah. that's the representation that, according to Maldesino Aguri, you have to add to your spectrum. And from this free field realization, it looks like as arising from the spectral flow of the free fields. But uh, I see there is a question. Yeah, I was going to tell you, Matthias, there's a question from Hank. Uh, yeah, so just to sort of, um, because I understand spectral flow from another perspective, at least I've seen this um, name pop up in another context, where you basically have, as you said, unbounded spectrum, but then as you make a gate transformation, a large gate transformation, you pump one of the zero modes upwards. So as you said, that's sort of like a bare face winding. Um, it, is it the same idea here? I, I'm not entirely sure what you're referring to, but I suspect it's a, it's a similar idea. Um, I mean, there is a spectral flow in, in other contexts. I mean, normally it means the same thing. I should mention one thing here. So. You could also, I mean, you may wonder, why did I look at the SL2R bit rather than the SU2 bit? I could do the same thing for the SU2, but for SU2, 
actually you still get a bounded spectrum, even after spectral flow. And that has to do with the fact that the, in some sense the fermionic zero modes you can only apply a finite number of times and then you sort of run out of going more negative. So mm -hmm. it is really special to the fact that this is a non-compact Katsumudi algebra that leads to the fact that you really get an honestly unbounded L0 spectrum. And, and it's, this, it's very important that you have an honestly unbounded L0 spectrum and you really want to think of it in terms of the until the modes because you need this unbounded L0 spectrum to get the physical spectrum that you want just like you need to get it in flat space string theory. Yeah, it's just that, like, the fact that the spectrum is unbounded, for example, in condensed matter system, this is um, because you have the Fermi surface or the Fermi C, is because, like, if you do this pumping of the zero mode, you still have the same spectrum. That's not possible with a bounded spectrum. So I was just wondering, like, if there's a connection. Well, I mean, as I was trying to say, I mean, it's a little bit different for fermions than for symplectic bosons because there is never anything like a Fermi C for symplectic bosons. Right, Because right. the bosons you can apply as many times as you want. So the situation is a little bit different for the fermions and the bosons. And so I, I, I'm not entirely sure how it relates okay. to your, 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 um, your Fermi C picture, but for, for here it is very important that this is a, a truly unbounded spectrum. Okay, okay. And, uh, and, and that's what mm -hmm. you need in order to get the right string spectrum. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so this is this is spectral flow. So so this takes some moment to get used to, but it's important and I mean if you're uncomfortable with it, just uh, just use this formally here and you'll be fine. This formally are just going to always do the right thing for you. Sorry, I think I've lost my iPad pen again. Not sure what's happening today. My Apple pencil doesn't seem to be that happy. Um so, so we, we, we will just be able to deal with this algebraically and you'll see how it goes. Okay, so, so this is how I wrote down what the, what the, uh, the, the, the generators will look like, how the generators transform under spectral flow. So let's understand a little bit what this means for the Maschel condition and how we're going to solve the constraint equation. Right, there's so, another question you got okay. before. Uh, Rohit? Uh, so, do we still just have short representations? Uh, thought we wanted to avoid uh, long representations because of uh, the continuum problem, and uh, you said that uh, we avoid short representations. We avoid long representations because we have k equals one. I mean, it's not that we avoid them. I mean, k equals one avoids them for us. I mean, we, we don't have any choice. For k equals to one, these are the only representations there are. And because I'm using the three fields, I'm automatically sitting at k equals one, and I'm therefore automatically dealing with these special classes of representations. So the representations are the representations, and because I've described them in terms, and I'm going to continue describing them in terms of the three fields, I'm automatically sitting at k equals one, and I'm taking all these constraints automatically into account. Um, but it seems like uh, you have, um, so when you flow the representations, it seems like uh, you have, uh, K, K, get, K, K is also multiplied by W uh, in your Right. So, okay, so may, maybe you are, okay, so I've written, so spectral flow actually exists for all K. So I've written the formula as a function for general K, but I'm only going to apply it when I, whenever I'm writing anything in terms of the three fields, I'm always sitting at K equals to one. So because I'm going to work with the three fields, I'm always going to work at k equals to one. I just wrote this spectral flow automorphism in a more general context because it's actually true more generally. It's not specific to k equals to one. Yeah, but but the, so the picture is not that uh, spectrally flowed representations are secretly high high spectral representations at higher k. No, 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 no. no. I mean, the, the, pro the problem with anything gets worse, right? I mean, k equals to one is as benign as it gets. K bigger than one, everything is wilder. So it doesn't matter. I mean, all of these representations get unbounded, whether you look at the short ones or the non-short ones or whatever. It's this, the spectral flow, the unboundedness of the L0 spectrum, that's totally generic. That's already in Maldacino Gori. I'm just describing it for you in this context. I'm applying it to the k equals to 1 case, but that's not at all specific to k equals to 1. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, 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 so these are these generators, and probably here I should have replaced every k by 1, because from now on I'm going to set k equals to 1, because I'm working in this free field realization, but I just copied the formula I had previously, and they were written down for general k. 
Okay, so now I want to explain to you how you get some of these physical states. So, so let's let's look at the simplest physical states. Let's look how we can make a physical state out of the Ramon sector, ground states, before spectral. So remember, we have to set m1 minus m2 equals to a half because that was the condition that z0 is equal to zero. That came from that comes from z0 is equal to zero. So we have to impose that. And now let's try to see how we're going to solve L0 is equal to zero. Now L0 is equal is given here. So L0 is equal to L tilde zero. L tilde zero on these states is equal to zero plus W times K30. So remember, so K30 on these states is a half. So in order to kill this contribution, I also want J3 tilde zero to be a half. So I want J3 tilde zero to be a half, and this means that M1 plus M2 is equal to a half. It just means that I'm going to take M1 equal to a half and M2 equal to zero. Right? Then I've solved the this equation and I've solved this equation. So that's a state that satisfies z0 is equal to zero. It obviously satisfies that n is equal to zero because it's a ground state. It satisfies L0 is equal to zero. It also says it satisfies Ln is equal to zero, so that's all fine. And what this representation has J3 tilde equal to K3 tilde equal to a half. And therefore, in terms of the untilde modes, the corresponding state after spectral flow has J3 zero equal to K3 zero is equal to W plus one over two. And that state will be a physical state. That's a physical state because I've just shown that it satisfies L0 is equal to zero and Z0 is equal to zero. Now this state will turn out to correspond to the BPS state of the dual CFT of the dual CFT. Now, in order, and it will come from the W cycle twist detector, but in order to be able to explain that to you, now is the moment I have to switch sides and move from the world sheet to the dual CFT and give you a two slide reminder of what the symmetric orbital theory looks like so you know what we should be comparing with. I mean, I claim that this is a, a nice state, so now I have to explain to you what I should be comparing it with. So what I want to compare it with is the symmetric orbital theory of T4. So I'm going to take T4, I have four free bosons and four free fermions. I take n copy of those, and then I divide by the symmetric group. I make them invariant under permutation of the copies. So then, as you know, as in any orbifold, there is something called the untwisted sector. The untwisted sector is everything you can make out of the theory before your orbifold, modulo its invariant under the orbifold action. So these are the permutation invariant combinations that you can make out of this stuff. But then, what's important is that you also have twisted sectors, and the twisted sectors of an orbifold are associated to the conjugacy classes of the orbifold group. So in our case, the orbifold group is the permutation group, so the twisted sectors are associated to the conjugacy classes of the symmetric group. Now, what are the conjugacy classes of the symmetric group? Now, so a permutation is some assignment mapping integers 1 to n up to integers 1 to n, and if you write this in terms of these cycles, then what you can easily convince yourself of is that the, just with the different conjugacy classes are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the different cycle shapes. So I, I, I'm not sure whether people know what cycle shapes are, but say if n is equal to 5, for example, that is a permutation written in, in, in cycle form. So this means 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3, 3 goes to 1, 4 goes to 5, 5 goes to 5 form. And the cycle shape is it has one cycle of length 3 and one cycle of length 2. And under conjugation, you can't change that fact. And therefore, the conjugacy classes are just labeled by the different cycle shapes. But different cycle shapes are nothing different but different partitions of n. So the different conjugacy classes of the symmetric group, and therefore the different twisted sectors, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the partitions of n. Now, this is the full dual CFT but we want to compare it with the single world sheet from the string theory side. So we are looking at the analog of the single particle states, the analog of the single trace states from the point of view of, of super mills. And the folklore belief is that the single particle, particle states or the single trace states 
correspond to the single cycle sectors. So single cycle sectors would be a cycle of the form, say, one, two, three, and then you have a, a four cycle and a five cycle that are one cycle, so often people, you don't write them, you don't write the one cycles, so you would say this is a three cycle state, and it's a single cycle because it consists of a single cycle of length three and nothing else. And the, the picture is that what we are going to map to are the single particle states coming from the single cycle sectors of the semantic orbital in the end goes to infinity limit. When we take n to infinity, that simply means there is no restriction on the length of the cycle. I mean, in general, the cycle has to be shorter than n, but if n is uh, 10 trillion, then you can have cycles up to length 10 trillion, and if n goes to infinity, you can have cycles as long as you want. So we are going to look at the single cycle sectors of the symmetric orbital. That's what our perturbative world sheet description will make contact with. Now, what does such a single uh, cycle twisted sector look like? So let's, let's not think about T4. Let's think about a single free boson. I mean, the fact that you have four of them doesn't matter, and the fact that the fermions, they do exactly the same thing. So let's think about what the W cycle twisted sector looks like for a single boson. Okay, so here we have a... Oh, no, this thing doesn't work again. Very annoying. Sorry. Not sure what I'm doing differently today than last time, but uh, today my Apple Pencil doesn't like me anymore. You don't happen to have another device nearby, but that's why I can... No, and my setup is, I thought, exactly like last time, but apparently it oh, isn't. Okay. okay, so so here we have this W cycle uh, uh, twist field. And what does this mean? Well, it means that if you take your field and you move it once around, then by the time you end up back again, the, 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 this permutation that's associated to this twist will have acted on it. So if you take the twist for simplicity to be associated to the permutation one up to W, what this will mean is that field BXA uh, will go to BXA plus one under F for A is equal to one up to W minus one, and BXW will go to DX one, right? That's what this permutation will do to you, right? It takes field number one and it becomes field number two, two becomes three, and so on. Field number W comes back to one. That's why it's sort of a W W twisting, W winding sort of description. Now, how do you describe the degrees of freedom in this W twisted sector? Well, the idea is that we define the following combinations of, of boson fields. So we are defining the combination of boson fields where we take the copies A is equal to 1 to W and we multiply the, the fields together, but we multiply them together with the phase, e to the 2 pi i L a over W. So this is just a certain linear combination of these different fields, dx1, dx2, up to dxw. Instead of looking at 1, 2, w, I'm looking at these linear combinations, and there are w such linear combinations. I'm just working in a slightly different basis. Now, why is this a smart thing to do? Well, if you think about it, this is a smart thing to do because you see the field dxl, if you take it once around, you see a becomes a plus 1, a plus 1 becomes a plus 2. Each of them just picks up a factor of e to the 2 pi i l over w times dxl. So this is the linear combination that's sort of the eigenstate with respect to the cyclic permutation. That's the thing that just picks up a phase when I want to take it around. Now, why is this useful? Well, remember, this is a linear combination of spin 1 fields, so it's still a spin 1 field. So if I were to write down the work expansion of it, it will look like follows. It will have some modes, some over R, dxlr times z to the minus r minus 1. That's how I would down, write down the mode expansion for any spin 1 field. And since this is a linear combination of spin 1 fields, it's still a spin 1 field, so that's what I'm going to write down as its mode expansion. But now think about it. What, it, what I mean when I take this field uh, once around here, what it means is I should evaluate this field at e to the 2 pi i z, Right? I take it from z, and I take it once around, so then I end up at e to the 2 pi i z. So if I plug this into here, what I get is dx l r times z to the minus r minus 1, and then I get e to the minus 2 pi i times r. I also get e to the minus 2 pi i, 
but e to the minus 2 pi i is 1, so I'm just writing only the e to, I'm only writing the term coming from the r here. And now I know from this description that this should be equal to e to the 2 pi i l over w times dx of l. And if you compare these two things, you see what this tells you is that, uh, that r, r here will not run over the integers. It has to run over the numbers minus l w mod 1. Right? Because if r is of the form minus l over w, then this factor will just reproduce from you this factor. You see, this piece is exactly the same as this piece. So this factor has to reproduce this factor, and that tells me that r has to be equal to minus l over w mod 1. So, so what's happened? I started with w fields, namely dx1 up to dxw. I converted them into these funny linear combinations here, and these funny linear combinations, they have standard mode expansions, except that the mode numbers are not integers anymore, as they used to be, but now they are fractional. They are fractional mode numbers of the form minus l over w. So the way I can think about this is that instead of working with w many fields, it looks as though I'm working just with one field, but this one field now has the property that its modes are not just integers, but they are any fractional value in 1 over w. And therefore, I've sort of taken account of all of these linear combinations. Which linear combination I'm dealing with depends on which fractional part of the mode number I'm looking at. If I'm looking at the mode numbers of the form minus 1 over w, then I'm looking at the field dx1, and so on. So I can think of the twisted sector as basically still being made up from one boson, except the mode numbers are now not integers, but they are fractional, and the fractionality depends on which cycle twisted sector I'm looking at. So in the W cycle twisted sector, my mode numbers will be W fractionally moded. So, so that's basically what the, what, what the twisted sector will look like. The way they will look like, they will basically look like T4, except that all the mode numbers are now much smaller. They are, fract they are fractional in 1 over W. Now there's also an effect coming from the ground state energy, and there's a shift up in the ground state energy coming from the Casimir energy and so on, and I don't want to get into the details of it, but what you find is that if you do this for T4, i.e. you do it for four bosons and four fermions, and you keep track of this ground state energy, then what you find is that the ground state energy conspires in such a way that the sector contains a BPS state in the W cycle twisted sector, with h equal to w plus or minus, actually it contains two BPS states, um, and this is also equal to the SU2 spin. So each W cycle twisted sector ends up having two BPS states, one with h equal to w plus 1 over 2, and one with h equal to w minus 1 over 2, and the state which we got here is the one that corresponds to w plus 1 over 2. So we reproduce one of the two BPS states in the W cycle twisted sector, and the other one you also get, but that involves the fermions, so I'm not discussing that in great detail. The two BPS states are actually related to one another by the action of the fermionic mode, so because I'm trying to keep things simple here, I'm just looking at the bosons, so we are only going to see one of the two BPS states. Okay, so we see one of the BPS states, that's good, but obviously we don't just want to see the BPS states, we want to see the full spectrum. So how about the rest of the spectrum? Well, so let's think about it, what we have to do from the world sheet perspective. So from the world sheet perspective, we start out with having a T4. We have this U1,1 slash 2 at level 1. And if you count them, so there are four bosons and four syntactic bosons, and I'm ignoring the fermions. I also have four fermions and four fermions from here and four fermions from here. But let's just look at the bosons. It's technically simpler, and the fermions as is always in life, just follow suit to what the bosons do. So let's not worry too much about the term. Let's think about what the physical state conditions will do for us. Well, the physical state conditions we'll have to impose is that the LN modes have to be zero, so it has to be primary with respect to zero, zero. And remember, that always removes two bosonic degrees worth of freedoms, because you see there's one state that are annihilated, so your demand that LN is equal to zero, 
but then the L minus M descendants are spurious and they are null and they decouple. So the LN condition actually removes two oscillator bosons first. And the same is actually true for the CN. That's what I just explained to you before. The CN positive condition reduces the number of oscillators by one, and then all the C minus N oscillators are spurious and null, so this also removes two bosons. So if you just count naively, we have four plus four, so we have eight bosons here. We're removing two plus two here. So at the end of the day, we are just left over with four bosons that survive. And let's just, for the sake of argument, take them to be associated to the torus. And I'm afraid my Apple pen has taken another break. So we have to remind us of its existence. And here we go again. Okay, so now, so now let's think about what we can make out of the torus bosons acting on one of these ground states. And remember, that's, as regards the boson, the only thing there is, because we have the zero modes acting here, the negative modes we've removed, and then these are the bosons of the torus. So now we have to impose these two conditions. We have removed the, the positive mode conditions. We have removed in saying that we've got rid of all of these bosons. So now we just have to worry about the zero mode condition. So the Z0 condition will just demand that M1 minus M2 is equal to a half, because the Z0 doesn't see this stuff. This stuff comes from the T4. The Z0 comes from the symplectic bosons. So that's just invisible. It just sees the ground state. So it just sees M1 minus M2 is equal to a half. Now, what about the physical state condition, the mesh shell condition? Well, so we're going to get a contribution from the bosons. So N will simply be the sum over the mode numbers NL and I, I from 1 to L. This is just keeping track of the L0 excitation number coming from here. And then you get the L0 on the ground states, but the L0 in the spectrally flowed sector is just given by W times K3 tilde 0 minus J3 tilde 0. That's on one of these slides I had before, right? This is just this identity. And L0 tilde is 0 on these ground states, so the only thing we have to keep track of is this piece. Now, K30 tilde is equal to a half on these states. So, K30 tilde is equal to a half, and J30 tilde is equal to M1 times plus M2. So, this gives us an equation for M1 minus M2, and it gives us an equation for M1 plus M2, so this will fix M1 and M2 uniquely. And I could obviously work it out, but actually I don't have to. You see, the only thing I'm interested in is what's the space-time conformal dimension of the state I'm getting. So what's the space-time conformal dimension? That's what J30 is. J30 is, is the SL2R0 mode, and this is to be identified with L0 from the point of view of the space-time theory. So what is the eigenvalue of L0 on this state? Well, L0, you see, is, is the tilde mode plus the shift coming from W over 2. So I just have to work out what J30 tilde is, but J30 tilde is determined by this equation. I can equate, solve this equation for J30 tilde. I simply bring it to the other side and divide it by W. So you see that J30 tilde is just a half plus W over, uh, plus N over W. So you get the N over W plus the half from here. And this piece gives you W over 2. So that's the equation you end up with for the conformal dimension of the state, of this physical state, uh, with respect to the space-time perspective. But what does this look like? Well, this looks like exactly this state from the point of view of the symmetric orbit fold. You see, the ground state has conformal dimension W plus 1 over 2, as I told you. And then each, in the W cycle twisted sector, I have mode numbers that are not integers. They are fractionally moded by W. So this N over W is simply the number of W fractionally moded modes I've applied to this state, and that therefore has conform that has conformal dimension equal to that, because you see L0 on this will just be N over W plus W plus 1 over 2. So that's exactly the conformal dimension of the, the space time, the, space, the conformal dimension of this state matches exactly with the J3 zero eigenvalue of this physical state in the world sheet. And you see, you can do this for any combination of the bosons, right? I mean, I'm not, I can pick anything I want here. I've already taken care of all the positive mode constraints. I'm solving the zero modes constraints. 
For each of these states, there's exactly one physical state in the space-time theory, and the physical state in the space-time theory is dual to is exactly that state, and it matches exactly as regards its, its conformal dimension. It also matches as regards its SV2 spin. So this is how all the descendants on my worldship theory get mapped to all the descendants in the single cycle sector of the symmetric orbital theory. And you can simply enumerate them. Any state you pick here, you choose your favorite bosonic descendant. Remember, in the W cycle twisted sector, they are W fraction loaded. And then you know exactly what world sheet state you have to write down to that corresponds to that state under this description. And I've done it here for the bosons, but I hope you can trust me, you can do the same thing for the fermions. And what you see is that everything you can make here, you can write exactly in one-to-one -one correspondence with all the descendants you make here. And therefore, what you see is that the physical spectrum of your world sheet theory matches exactly the single particle spectrum of the symmetric orbital of T4, where by single particle I mean I only look at the, double, the single cycle twisted sectors, so the cycle twisted sectors are labeled by a single integer, the length of the single cycle, and I reproduce it plus all its, all its descendants. So this shows that this world sheet theory reproduces exactly the full spectrum, the full single particle spectrum of the symmetric orbital of T4. So that's the first very good evidence that that is the world sheet description of the symmetric orbital theory. Okay, are there any questions about this? Uh, Joao has There's a question. There's one question, Joao. Maybe I can ask a brief question. So, so th does that give you some intuition about really the relation between the T4 on the boundary CFT and the T4 on the world sheet, it looks that they are really very closely connected. That you right. Much, is it like some multiple cover of the Yeah, it's basically the multiple cover. So the, the W spectral flow leads to this uh, W cycle cover. And that will become, I mean, the torus is basically the torus. It's the same torus. And it's just that the spectral flow basically produces for you this W fold cover, which what what the symmetric open fold really gives you. But that probably becomes a little bit clearer in the next thing I'm going to explain to you, namely how the correlators match, because there you will see this covering in a appearing in a somewhat more concrete fashion. So maybe I'll continue with that. So okay, so now let's remind let's start again on the symmetric orbit fold side. Let's think about so, so now we've matched the spectrum. Now we want to see that the correlators match. Once you've matched the spectrum and the correlators, you can declare success. So let's try to match the correlators. And uh, we are going to look at, uh, again, the single cycle twisted sectors. And uh, as I've explained to you, these come from the worldship perspective from things with spectral flow equals to W. Now let's think about how you calculate correlation functions in the symmetric orbit fold. Now, the correlation functions in the symmetric orbit fold are a little bit complicated. So let's look at correlation functions that involve, say, three fields from different uh, single cycle twisted sector. And for the sake of argument, let's take them, each of them to be in the W cycle twisted sector. And let's take W to be odd for, for concreteness. Actually, it's only non zero if W is equal to odd. Then I claim there is a non zero correlation function uh, from the point of view of the symmetric orbit fold. And what this has to mean is that from the point of view of the world sheet theory, there must be a non-trivial correlation and function involving three spectrally flowed vertex operators, where each of them is spectrally flowed by a W, by, by W amount. So in particular, this is something which has been somewhat uh, confusing in the past because people thought that such correlators on the world sheet would be zero, but I want to explain to you that this is not true. And so I want to explain to you the structure of the symmetric orbit for correlators and how you calculate them, and then we'll mirror this from the point of view of the, of the world sheet theory. So, so let's look at the simplest example. Okay, 1, 1, 1 is a bit trivial. So let's look at a case where we look at a three-point function. Uh, we look at a three-point function for the case of three vertex operators, each have a, a three-cycle twisted sector. Now, this correlator is not equal to zero, so how do you see this uh, concretely? Well, you see what this means is I have to find three cycle permutations that are associated to these three twist fields so that the product of the permutations 
multiplies to the identity. Okay, so let's check that that's true. So you see sigma 3, so you take 1 to 2, 2 goes to 4, 4 goes to 1. Okay, 1 goes to 1. Then 2 goes to 3, 3 goes to 2, 2 goes to 2, 3 goes to 1, one ha nothing happens here, 1 goes to 3, so 3 stays the same, 4 doesn't do anything, 4 goes to 3, 3 goes to 4, so each of them goes back to itself, so the product of these three, three cycle permutations multiplies together to give you the identity. So therefore, there should be a non-zero correlator involving these three, three cycle twisted uh, sectors, because that's basically how you calculate a correlation function, so how you constrain the, the fusion rules of, a, of an orbital function. Now, how do you actually calculate symmetric orbital correlators? Now, there's a very smart idea for how to do this. And this has to do with the fact that you should really think of this as some sort of winding effect. So, so think about back at this picture I drew for you when we derived this funny fractional mode it uh, fields. I mean, that's really the way you should think about the W cycle twisted field. What it is, it's a field that, as you go around, produces a W fold cover. Right? So the way I think about it is this is a, this is a multi-story car park that has the W covers, except when you reach the top floor, you can go up once further, but then you reach the bottom floor. That's what this multi-story car park looks like. And that's exactly what the twist field does for you, because it moves you up in the copies, and then finally it moves you down again. So you can try to describe the correlation functions in the symmetric orbifold by thinking of lifting it to the world of the covering surface. So what this should mean is that around each twist field, you want to think of the surface as being covered by something that has W many copies, such that as, as when you go around as a car, you go around and then you come back again at the bottom after W many turns. Now this is what you have to do near each of these twist fields, and then if you have a correlator with a number of twist fields, you are looking for the holomorphic map that has locally exactly this property, but is globally patched together in a way that's consistent with this. And if you can find such a map, that's what you call a covering map. The covering map is simply a holomorphic map from this, from this funny surface that looks like a multi-story car park around all the special points, and otherwise looks like distinct copies of, of car park spaces where you can uh, easily drive along. So you, you can think of it being a car, and around each of the special points, when you go around, you go up and down, but then you can travel across, and then you reach some other critical point there you go down by W2 times, and so on. And the idea is that the efficient way of calculating correlation function, the symmetric orbital, is to use the conformal transformation associated to this covering map. Now, this covering map looks a little bit complicated, so let's give you an example. So let's look at our familiar friend, the correlator involving three three cycle twist detectors. So we're looking at the covering map that is a map that is from some surface, in this case it'll also be a sphere, down to the sphere down here that has three special points around which you get the threefold covering. And what I claim is that the relevant covering map is simply given by this uh, ratio of polynomials is z4 minus 2z cubed over 1 minus 2z. And this function has the property that it maps 0 to 0, it maps 1 to 1, it maps infinity to infinity, so I'm assuming that these points sit at 0, 1, and infinity. And then, in order for this to be the correct covering map, the property it has to satisfy is that near 0, it, looks, it maps 0 to 0, but it then it has a triple uh, a z to the 3 behavior around 0. Near 1, it maps 1 to 1, but then it maps, it behaves like z1, z minus 1 to the power cubed, and near infinity, well, you should go to infinity by replacing z by 1 over u and gamma of z by 1 over gamma, then it has to behave exactly like that. And if you take this function and you plug it into Mathematica, or maybe you are an old-fashioned guy and can do this in your head or with pen and paper, and you expand it around 0, 1, and infinity, then this is exactly what you find. And so this is the map that satisfies all the right properties. It has the property that gives you a threefold covering around 0, 1, and infinity, and therefore it sort of uh, looks exactly like this, uh, like this uh, locally, it looks like this covering that I'm interested in in order to describe the, uh, the correlation function of the symmetric orbital theory. 
Now, probably, this, so, okay, maybe you have understood uh, that what these covering maps are and what they do, and uh, let me tell you one more fact about them in general. So, if I'm assuming that the, actually, it's not entirely the general case. I'm assuming here that the covering surface is also a sphere, and in this case, the number of coverings, or sometimes called the number of active colors, is given by that formula. So, for example, for the case of three Ws all being equal to three, as Three minus one over two is one, so you get one plus one plus one plus one, so you get n equals to four, and that relates to the fact that this is a, 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 a fourth order polynomial in uh, in the numerator. Well, here I've taken infinity to infinity, so it's not fourth order in the denominator, but generically it would be fourth order in the denominator as well. And you can always write it in this form as a polynomial of degree n divided by a polynomial of degree n. And the condition that you have to satisfy in order for this to be have the right branching behavior around the, 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 the special points is that, the, that this uh, equation has to be true. Because you see, if you plug this into the numerator, what this tells you is Pn minus is equal to minus xp plus plus order z minus z i to the w. So the minus xi over p plus cancels this p plus. So this goes like xi plus something of order z minus z i to the power w. So if you can write a function like that with this property, then you've constructed the covering map. Um, Matthias, this uh, about six to eight minute warning. Right. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm I'm aware of this. Okay. Thank you. So 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 why why am I banging on about this covering map? I, actually, it's very pretty mathematics. I mean, there's a I mean, it's Hurwitz theory, and you can have lots of fun constructing these functions with all of these properties and so on. And uh, there's lots of nice facts about them. But why is this interesting? But think about the simplest example you may be interested in. Namely, think about you want to calculate the correlator where you pick the ground state in each twisted sector. So you're looking at, from, at the correlator and the symmetric orbit board. You have, say, three fields, each of which is the, the ground state of the twisted sector. Now, the intuition is that once you move this up to the covering surface, then you have basically described the fact that you've been dealing with twisted sector fields. So that part of the story has been taken into account by going to the covering surface, because the covering surface provides for you this winding number by W, which is what this W cycle twisted sector really describes. So once you lift this to the covering surface, on the covering surface, there's nothing left, because these were the ground states. There weren't any excitations there. So once you go into the covering surface, you just have to calculate the vacuum correlator on the covering surface. But the vacuum correlator on the sphere is just equal to 1. So what this tells you is that in order to calculate this correlator, the only thing you have to calculate is this covering map. And once you've found the covering map, all the information about the correlator comes from the conformal factor associated to this covering map. This covering map is not a Möbius transformation in general, so therefore it will have some non-trivial information. And it's, it leads to a conformal factor, and the conformal factor is what describes for you the correlator of the symmetric orbit. So you have totally geometrized the calculation of the correlation functions in the symmetric orbit fold. All you have to do is find the covering surface, and then the actual value of the correlation function depends simply on the covering surface and on the conformal factor that is associated to this holomorphic map. And this conformal factor you can uh, calculate, for example, by using... Uh, a Leoville term, a la Lune and Matua, and that's the efficient way of calculating correlation functions in the symmetric orbit theory. Again, sorry, I have to uh, get my Apple pencil back to work. Okay, so this is this is why it's once you found the covering surface, you've basically solved the correlation function. And more concretely, if you look at the correlation function say of a three-point function, then Using these techniques, you can show that it's always of this form where the AIs are the coefficients that appear in this description of the covering surface. So the covering map map set i to xi up to a term that goes like z minus zi to the wi. And the coefficient in front here is something that you can't, that's fixed by the conformal covering map. And the answer for this correlator will just depend on these numbers in this fashion. Now this looks pretty unobvious, but when you actually work this out, you see, if you put them at different positions, if you don't put them at 0, 1, at infinity, if I put them at different positions, 
then the AI gammas will depend on where these positions are, and this dependence will reproduce correctly the, the, the Z dependence or the, the conformal dependence of this correlation function. So it's all built into the, into the cake, but that's the clever way of calculating symmetric orbital correlators, and that was pioneered by Lunin and Matur, and that's the way in which our world sheet calculation would calculate these correlators. That's what we are going to reproduce from the world sheet. This is a very specific way of calculating correlation functions in the symmetric orbital. Now, so if you don't understand all the details, what you should take away from this is that the correlation functions are uniquely determined by this covering map. So as long as I can retrieve the covering map, then I can basically calculate the correlator. So, um, so how am I doing for time? Um, we can do like... Okay, so let, let, let me explain this final slide, and then I'll explain the details next time, if that's okay. Yeah, sorry, I think I... <laughs> yeah, I was going to say like five minutes. Uh, ah, okay, uh, maybe then... Okay, so... Because the pencil was not being taken okay, nicely today, okay, so then we'll do that. Okay, so, so yeah. then maybe I'll explain two more slides. <laughs> <laughs> So, I'm, I, I, so I start. So we are looking at uh, correlation functions in symmetric orbit. We are going to evaluate them on the sphere because you see the boundary of ADS3 is a cylinder, and if you compactify the cylinder, then we are going to get a sphere. So we are always going to be interested in correlation functions of our CFT on the sphere. Now, as I try to convince you, in order to calculate these correlators, you have to lift them to the covering surface. But the covering surface, in general, will not be a sphere. The covering surface will have whatever genus it will have. It will be a Riemann surface because it's a conformal map, so it will map a conformal Riemann surface to the sphere, but it needn't be a sphere by itself. And in fact, if you ask what's the large n behavior of the symmetric orbifold correlators, and this was already observed long ago, then the large n behavior is effectively controlled by the genus of the covering surface that appears in the calculation of this correlator when you calculate them on the sphere. So, so the genus of this covering surface appears in a very special spot in this correspondence, namely it appears as the exponent of n, and if you think about how usually we relate the n-dependence of these symmetric orbital theories to the string coupling constant, or the n you should think of as being the analog of the rank of supernials, that's related to the string coupling constant as of the, of the string theory dual, that should be something like 1 over square root of n. So this will go like n to the 2gs. So, uh, sorry, so, so this, sorry, this will go like, um, like gs to the, uh, to the plus 2g, and therefore it behaves exactly like in string perturbation theory how higher genus world sheet contributions it contributes. So what this suggests is that if in the calculation of your correlation function you get a covering surface to appear at genus G, what this should correspond to from the point of view of the world sheet theory is that you were dealing with the world sheet contribution that came from a world sheet of genus G. I, the genus of the covering surface seems to be related to the genus of the world sheet contribution at which this piece of the, of the symmetric orbital correlator should come from. So what this suggests is that you should think of as the covering surface as basically being equal to the world sheet. Certainly, if you can think of it in that way, then basically you're going to reproduce all the correct g-string corrections to your calculation because the higher genus contribution from the, from the world sheet will reproduce exactly the 1 over n contribution that you would expect from the dual CFT. So this is a very suggest I mean, this was already suggested by Kakman, Rastelli, and Razamet many years ago, that if this duality works, the way it should work is that you should think of this covering surface as being equal to the world sheet of the, of the string theory CFT that is dual to the symmetric orbital theory. So this is simply an observation based on the fact how the 1 over n behavior of the symmetric orbital correlators behaves relative to the genus of this covering surface, the covering surface appearing very naturally in the calculation of the correlators. Now, at this time, this was a, a pious wish. This was a, a nice hope. This was wouldn't it be nice if type of statement. But now that we have a concrete world sheet theory at our hand, we should be able to check whether that is true or not. 
because we have a proposal for what this world shift theory is that is dual to the symmetric orbifold theory. So these correlation functions of the symmetric orbifold that we've just uh, described to you, they should arise as the modular integral over some world sheet correlation function that we calculate in our world sheet CFT. And we should see whether this idea that somehow the genus of the covering surface is related to the genus of the world sheet is reproduced microscopically from our concrete world sheet description. This is something we cannot test. We can see whether that's true or not. Now, in order to explain that, what's important is what we have to calculate on the string theory side. So remember here, the, the vertex operators in the dual CFT, they sit at various positions on the sphere. Now, from the point of view of the world sheet, the vertex operators will sit at the position on the world sheet, and as you know, we'll have to integrate over all the different positions on the world sheet. So there will be a z-dependence, so the z-dependence will always be dependent on the world sheet. That will be integrated over, as we always do in string theory, but in order to reproduce the x-dependence of the correlation functions, we obviously need to endow our vertex operators also with an x-dependence on the world sheet, because otherwise we can never reproduce this x-dependence of the dual CFT. Now, there is an essentially canonical way in which you endow the vertex operators associated to the states with the x-dependence. And that comes from the fact that we have this operator state correspondence. So suppose we are interested in the vertex operator corresponded to a, to a Ramon sector ground state in the W floats, uh, uh, spectrally float sector. So let's uh, take a state to be of that form. Then if we insert this at position x equal to zero and z equal to zero, then we know which vertex operator it corresponds to from the point of view of the symmetric orbifold. As I explained to you, if you set this equal to a half and this equal to zero, it will correspond to the DPS operator here. Right? This is what we saw earlier. So this is how the states are identified between the world sheet and the dual CFT. But now we want to make states x-dependent and z-dependent. But there's a canonical way in which you do it, because you see there's a translation operator on the world sheet, and there's a translation operator in the dual CFT. What's the translation operator on the world sheet? Well, it's the operator e to the z l minus 1. So we're going to conjugate the vertex operator at position z equal to 0 by e to the z l minus 1 and e to the minus z l minus 1. That will give us the vertex operator evaluated at z. And likewise, we're going to do the same thing for the space-time CFT, we are going to conjugate by e to the xj plus zero and e to the minus xj plus zero to describe for us the, the, the vertex operator inserted at position x, remembering that we call that j plus zero is to be identified with l minus one of the dual CFT, right? The, the Möbius group of the dual CFT is j plus zero, j three zero, and j minus zero, and the l minus one of the, of the, of the dual CFT is to be identified with this j plus zero operator. So there's a canonical way in which you can define what the x dependence and the z dependence of this vertex operators are. Now my Apple pencil has given up again, so I can't point anymore, but what I'm going to show to you next time is that this, uh, what I, I can wiggle, so the, 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 the correlator that's written there, the integral, the z integral of the correlator, I want to explain to you that that will reproduce exactly the symmetric orbifold answer. And the way it will do it is that we'll, what we'll show is that the world sheet correlator will actually be delta function localized to those configurations that admit a conformal covering map. And you will pick up simply all the contributions from the covering map and thereby reproduce, in some sense, manifestly the answer for the symmetric orbifold theory. But that's for next time. I'm already a little bit over time even with my pen, Apple Pen problems, so I'll stop here and uh, continue at this stage next time. Okay, thank you, Matthias. Uh, let's give a big round of applause. Thanks. Um, okay, so I see there's one uh, raised hand uh, already by uh, Max. So yes. Max, please go ahead. Can you hear me well? Yes. 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 Okay, so I have a basic question. So uh, the the model in the worship is a closed stream or is an open stream? It's a closed stream. It's a closed stream, right. So um, 
So you are saying that the spectrum of the cluster stream matches the spectrum in the dual CFP side, right? Right. So you're, you're quite right. I've, I've really only explained it for one car and a half. So you see, when I, when I wrote down this dictionary here, I, I, I really wrote down only the left moving piece. So there's a similar right. thing for the right movers. And in fact, there's also level matching you have to, I mean, there's a symmetric orbifold invariant, uh, and that comes out by virtue of the fact that on the world sheet, this alpha parameters for the left moving and the right movers have to be the same. But I, I've I lost over that. I see, I see. Okay, okay. Now I understand. So, and also, in your last formula, I think it's in, in your last slide, this vertex operator as a function of x and z. Well, so, so there we are doing what, what CFT people always do. I mean, when, whenever CFT people call, calculate 2D CFT people, calculate correlators, they just calculate chiral correlators. So what you have in mind is that this is a vertex operator that depends on x, x bar, z, and z bar, and you're freezing the x bar and z bar dependence, and you think of it as a function of x and z, and you're just trying to reproduce the correct x dependence. And then you do it for the for the anti-holomorphic degrees of freedom, and then at some later stage you worry how to put them together. That's how people normally calculate correlators in 2D CFT. Right, but for instance, in a standard string theory, in Nikolsky space, for instance, this de dependence on x is just the plane wave, right? It's just e to the ik dot, I -K dot x, right? Well, it's it's the position space analog of it, right? It's really the position where this sits. In the, in the dual CFT, right? Mm -hmm. So from the point of view of the dual CFT, we have some sphere. Oh, it doesn't work anymore. Oh, it still works. And then, and then you have these vertex operators sitting at specific positions, and these are the axes that what I mean by that here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. I see. But you're right. I mean, there is a subtlety. You have to... But this is, again, a disease of 2D CFT people. You see, you always think of Z and Z bar as independent variables, whereas, in fact, Z bar is the complex conjugate of Z. But mm -hmm. you solve this problem like modern states solve their finance problem. They say this is a problem for the next generation to sort out. You just mm -hmm. treat this as a function of Z, you treat it as a function of Z bar, and then you say, okay, at some st later stage, I'm going to Z, Z equal to Z bar, but let's not worry too much about that. And I'm taking that attitude here as well. Right, right, yeah, yeah, okay. I understand, thank you. Very good. Uh, next person in the list, uh, Andre Lima. Uh, hi, uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Um, the, the spectral flow uh, that you do on the string side, uh, on the bosons, the, the, the free field mode, does it have, in any way, it doesn't seem to me, but does it does it have in any way a relation to the spectral flow of the NICO4 superalgebra of the CFT theory? Mm, not, no, 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 no. I mean, the. So, so I, I'm not 100% sure exactly on which level you ask. I mean, so are you asking about P as a 1, 1 slash 2 being equal to. I mean, as I explained last time, that's the zero modes of this are to be identified with the global n equals to 4 superconformal symmetry in the space-time. So on that level, it doesn't respect it, because you see the zero modes uh, don't stay zero modes on the spectral flow, right? So it's not that zero modes stay zero modes. So it's not any, any simple transformation from the point of view of the n equals to of the dual n equals to 4 uh, picture. But the, the way you should think about it is that it really introduces the analog of this W-fold coverage. So the spectral flow really makes means that the string winds W many times. I mean, it's not entirely obvious from the point of view of the world sheet, but that's effectively what it does. Okay, I, I understand. Uh, I had forgotten that the, the, the correspondence of these algebra that you're showing now and the algebra and the, and the currents and the modes of the of the CFT uh, super algebra, uh, they, they're only hold that for the zero modes, right? Exactly. It's only the zero modes of these guys that you can identify with the n equals to the global n equals to four generators of the dual CFT. The okay. non-zero modes here don't have a direct uh, interpretation. I mean, remember, you're only meant to see stuff of the dual CFT after you've imposed the physical state condition. So the zero modes here, they commute with the physical state condition. So they map physical states to physical states, just like the global n equals to 4 symmetry in the dual CFT. 
The non-zero modes here don't map physical states to physical states, so they will not have any direct meaning in terms of the dual CFT, because the dual CFT is only the physical spectrum of your world GK. It's not, it's not the whole, the whole spiel. It's only the physical states that you see in the dual CFT. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on, uh, Joao, you're next on the list. Uh, yes, Matthias. So, thank you very much for the lecture. Just one small clarification. So in this formula that relates, that gives the correlator in terms of 1 over n expansion, do you have a sum over the genus or there's only a single genus? That's oh, no, no, yeah. So again, this is something I sort of glossed over. So if you actually, so what you, if you really want to calculate this, um, where is it? So, so, so when you calculate such a correlator, what you have to do is you have to find all covering maps over all genera. And then the correlator and the symmetric overfold there is the sum over all possible covering maps. And the contribution of a specific covering map contributes to this factor of n. So, and so, so, so the, the picture from the point of view of the world sheet is if you look at the corresponding world sheet operators, then you're going to calculate the correlators on the world sheet. You're going to calculate them on the world sheet of the sphere, on the torus, on the genus 2 surface, on the genus 3 surface. So the torus piece will contribute to the piece that goes here like 1 minus 0 minus n over 2. The torus piece on the world sheet will give you the contribution that goes like 1 minus 1 minus n over 2 and so on. But you get, for a given correlator, you get covering surface, covering maps from different genera in general. Just to clarify, then, then the covering map is unique once you say the, the genus and the... the so it's, it's, it's not unique, it's not unique, but there are, there are finitely many covering maps. I mean, if I specify the x's and the z's, then there are at most finitely many, but there may be more than one. There, may, there need not be one. And they are distinguished by the genus? Or not necessarily, but there are, there are finitely many. So, so, so the, the real answer, if you calculate this will be the sum over all covering maps, of all discrete covering maps. And then you, I mean, it's basically this formula that I wrote down here. So what you should have really said here, you have to sum over the covering maps here as well. You have to sum over all the, now for the three-point function on the sphere, for the three-point function, that doesn't happen. But in general, you would, if you had an endpoint function, you get the, the sum over covering maps. Each covering map has a specific choice of these A's, and you add up all of these contributions, and that gives you the full correlator from the point of view of the symmetric overflow. But and when you interpret this from the world sheet, then each piece will come from a different piece of the world sheet calculation. But in the world sheet, you would also sum over all the genera, right? I mean, if you calculate a, a, a certain correlator, you would have to sum over all the genera, you integrate over all the moduli, and what will happen is that when you integrate over the moduli, you only pick up discrete contributions from the specific places where a covering map exists, and then you sum over all the genera, and you just manifestly reproduce the symmetric overflow answer. And is it easy to then to classify all these covering maps? To, to easy is probably is not the right word. I think in general it's hard to find these covering maps. I mean, we wrote a paper where we analyzed this in the large space limit. That it becomes feasible again. There's actually a nice matrix model description in the limit where the Ws all get very large. But in general, this is a complicated problem to find the covering map. So, so here the spirit is not that we show the correspondence by being able to calculate either side. Right. In fact, both sides are difficult to calculate. But what we can show is that the virtual calculation reproduces what you would have to do if you were to do the other calculation. So therefore, without having to do the calculation explicitly, you see that the answer will match. And it somehow matches in a manifest way rather than in by checking zillions of examples for it. Thank you. Very good. So next, uh, Lucas. Uh, okay, good lecture. Uh, about your last uh, PowerPoint. I, I didn't quite understand the amplitude description you defined in the last PowerPoint. So I, I can't tell you uh, too well. He's asking so about the last where you wrote the vertex operator. I think. Ah, you mean this one? Yes. Yeah, yeah, this one. I I, I don't quite understand because uh, you are gauge fixing the pseudo sort of constraint, and then you apply r minus zero to translate the vertices. So. I got confused about that. I mean, 
No, 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 but I mean, I mean, this is how you, how, how, how you do this also in regular string theory, right? I mean, so this is just a fancy way of writing. I mean, normally, so, so normally what you do in string theory is uh, you would calculate the, cor uh, let's, let's do this. You would calculate the correlation function of your vertex operator. Uh, so let's say e to the uh, k uh, x at z1 up to vert e to the k l x at z l, right? And then that would be the world sheet correlator, and that would be the, 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 the state that corresponds to the, 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 the physical string state in target space. But what you have to do is you have to evaluate them at different positions z, and then you have to integrate over the zi, right? That's how you do a string theory calculation. Now, I'm, I'm simply asking what is the vertex operator evaluated at z? And the observation I'm making is you can write this as e to the z l minus 1, the vertex operator at psi 0, e to the minus z l minus 1, right? So, so this is the state. This state has to have L0 is equal to 0 or half or 1, or depending on where you, in which sort of picture you sit. But then the vertex operator as a function of Z is always obtained by translation by e to the Z L minus 1. And that's also what you do when you calculate this regularly in flat space string theory. Right? I mean, you, maybe you're not aware of the fact that you're conjugating by e to the Z L minus 1, but when you write down this vertex operator evaluated at position Z, that's, in fact, what you have done. I mean, you can show that the vertex operator at z is just the vertex operator at zero conjugated by the translation. Okay. So this effect is always true. So, so, so and, and that's exactly the spirit in which I'm writing down this correlator, right? So here, you will have uh, the correlator as a function of zi. You have to integrate over the zi. And I've simply said, we know how the z-dependence really arises. The z-dependence arises by conjugation by e to the z l minus 1. But once you've appreciated that that's how the z-dependence arises, then it's also obvious how the x-dependence should arise. Namely, it should arise by conjugation by e to the x j plus 0 and e to the minus x j plus 0, given the fact that j plus 0 is to be identified with the l minus 1 of the dual CFT. Uh, so those are should be think of integrated vertex operators. In the, no, so in the dual CFT, you're not integrating. The dual CFT is a CFT. It's not a string theory, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah we talk about the amplitude. The, the vertex yeah, operators are supposed to be integrated. Out. Absolutely. So I have to uh, do the integral over z here. Yeah, absolutely. This is okay. what I will have to do. And what we'll find is that these correlation functions, they will be proportional to delta functions. So this integral okay. over z will actually be trivial to evaluate, and it will reduce to a finite sum. And it will reduce to a finite sum of those configurations that admit the covering map. But I haven't yet explained to you how constraining this condition with the covering map is, so that's what I'll explain to you tomorrow. I'll explain to you tomorrow that there are, in fact, only discreetly many covering maps, and what this means is that this correlator is proportional to a delta function, and therefore this integral just becomes a finite sum, and what it reproduces is exactly this sum over the covering maps from the point of view of the dual CFT. Okay, understand. So all the goals are hidden in this measure, right? In this new measure. Right. So okay. So you have to be a bit careful. So okay. And the honest answer is we haven't completely kept track of the measure. What we've seen is that this is proportional to a delta function, and it has the delta function that fits together with this sum. So now the question is, what's the coefficient in front of each of these uh, configurations that contributes? That's the loose end we haven't entirely tied down. But you get the structure of the answer to come out right. And I think that already tells you that essentially that's, that must be the right answer. But admittedly, you then have to worry exactly what is this measure so that when you localize it, you pick up exactly the correct numerical coefficient so as to really reproduce this metric orbital answer. Why you don't introduce ghosts? There are some. It's hard. Maybe, uh, we're running a little bit long on time, so maybe. If it's right. So, so, so at this point, yeah. At this point, oh, the ghosts come in and all the rest of it. So, admittedly, that's that's a, a, if you wish, that's one of our the secret dark little corners that we haven't sorted out completely. But I invite somebody who is more powerful to look into that, I'm sure that will work out. I mean, I can't believe that the structure works out and it fails because we are not going to get these numerical coefficients right, but that's not what we have checked in detail so far.
Okay, maybe, and if uh, the last question from Andre, if it's very quick, uh, please go ahead. Uh, hi, no, you, I, I think you actually answered already in the last answers. When you say the worksheet is equal to the to the covering surface, uh, I was going to ask if there are uh, a horrid number of disconnected pieces of the worksheet, but it seems that this is a kind of... Uh, uh, figure of speech uh, that, that is more subtle than that. Uh, that, that you integrate over the whole sheet and it localizes over a Hurwitz number of points. Correct, so correct. But what this means is the world sheet where it contributes is the covering surface. I mean, the world sheet is the world sheet is the world sheet, right? And you're instructed to integrate over the entire world sheet. So what this sentence means is that the world sheet where the correlator is non zero is the world sheet that plays the role of the covering surface. And quite remarkably, these correlators are simply zero when the world sheet is not of the type to be the covering surface. I mean, these are very unusual correlators. I mean, certainly a few years ago, I wouldn't have expected any CF2, D, CFT to have such correlation functions. These are correlation functions that are not rational functions of the Z. They are, they are delta functions of the z as functions of the x. So they are very unusual, but as I'll explain to you next time, this is not something we just make up. This is something that you can deduce from the word identities of our world sheet theory. We have this free field description, and we can constrain the correlation functions, and we can show that the correlation functions have this delta function behavior so that the integral is only non-zero at those places where the world sheet plays the role of the covering space. Thank you. Okay, very good. So that concludes uh, this session. Uh, super interesting. So last round of applause for Matthias. Thank you uh, for the lecture. And um, if you have questions, please follow up. Like I'm sure it, like there's, I can see it reflected already. There's like lots of questions and interests. So please use Slack to follow up on any of the items uh, discussed today. And then we'll resume again at 2 p.m. Brazil time, um, translated to your own uh, local time zone. And then tomorrow, Matthias will give the last uh, their lecture, and tonight uh, there's the discussion session by Bob. Okay, very good. So okay. see you all soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.